right. Well, I'll keep an eye on the waiting room as we um, we get this show on the road. First of all, a warm welcome and thank you very much. A special thank you to Cheryl for the impetus to pull this fabulous, pardon the pun, <laughs> fabulous panel together. I'm really excited to see what happens here today and to learn more. Uh, I want to just point out, you, you should see a message on your screen alerting you to the fact that we are recording this session. We're doing that so folks who are in different time zones or have a different home situation and cannot join us during the day can join us at their leisure. And so hopefully they can follow up with you via email to share comments or questions. Um, for those of us here today, welcome. This is our small but mighty act of resistance to try to remain productive and engaged and, and having the conversations that, that enrich our work but also make our lives worthwhile. This is what we enjoy doing. So it's wonderful to be able to do that here with you today. So our format um, will be the standard Zoom meeting situation in which we will remain muted. Uh, we'll have folks presenting and we'll have um, a respondent to draw out some questions or themes. And then we'll open up the room just as we would if we were in an actual room together for comments and questions. We're a small enough group that I think we can participate individually. If you feel that you would like to do it to share links or resources or the questions as they occur to you in the chat, that's also sometimes useful. A literal and an actual parking lot for ideas so that we can come back to at the end of the conversation. So, I'll mention that we had originally scheduled four panelists. One is not able to join us today, but we do have Walter Merriman, Sean Matharu, and Summer Sutton. Um, and we have a respondent, but I'll, I'll pause for a moment and I'll, I'll shift gears and hand the microphone over to Cheryl Vint so that she can introduce our respondent for us. Okay, so um, thank you, uh, Catherine, and to the Center of Ideas and Society for giving us the space for the students to present their work. and. I'm also so happy to see so many of my, in uh, addition to the students that are presenting, so many other students here to support your peers. So thank you all for that. And I am so grateful to uh, Rebecca Sheldon and delighted to introduce her, um, her to you. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with Rebecca's works, but it's, uh, I'm so grateful that she's been generous with her time in order to um, enrich our discussions beyond the sort of UCR um, cohort of people. Rebecca is an associate professor in the Department of English at Indiana University in Bloomington, where she's also affiliated with the Department of Gender Studies. She's probably best known for her book, The Child to Come, Life After the Human Catastrophe, which came out in 2016 from Minnesota UP. And this book analyzes the political investments in futurity that are culturally attached to the figure of the child and how the shift into the context of the Anthropocene in which we now often think of the future in terms of threat uh, has changed some of the meanings that we can make out of the notion of the child and futurity. Her current research is focusing on um, questions of the future through speculative metaphys metaphysics, affect theory, and queer occultism. Occult Sorry, I'm not a very good pronouncer, it seems. Um, and she's known for work in feminist materialisms, queer theory, and a really wide range of ways of engaging with the possibilities that come with speculative thought and speculative fiction, which I think makes her such a great um, respondent to the program today. So um, thank you so much. And I guess we do our, our um, silent clapping to welcome Rebecca and thank her for attending here today. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. So we had a brief, thank you Cheryl as well for that wonderful introduction. So we had a brief chat before we started the meeting and we decided to move in the order of the um, names as were printed on the advertisements. So we'll hear from Walter, then Sean, then Summer. Uh, so Walter, this is your moment if you'd like to share your slides and share your work. All right. Um... Okay, well, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay. All right, so I have a title change, um, which I, um, it's from um, rewriting the paper for presentation. This title reflects more of what actually made it into this presentation today. Um, the original title references a critique of political units, and I'll return to that idea very briefly in the conclusion. Um, okay. 
In Archaeologies of the Future, Frederick Jameson argues that utopias and fiction are motivated by specific dilemmas and offer to solve fundamental social problems by the persistent and obsessive search for a simple, single-shot solution to all our ills. The premise of this paper is that Mohsen Hamid's novel, Exit West, offers a utopian moment in a description of technology in its closing pages. The novel presents this technology, a device that helps everyone vote, as a means to creating a universally inclusive democracy in a post-national order. The kind of order speculated about by writers such as Arjun Apadurai and Jürgen Habermas. This utopian moment invites us to consider the normative guidelines for how we structure political units in an era of globalization and migration. After defining what I mean by political units, I will argue that Exit West represents individual autonomy and freedom of movement as norms that can sustain a post-national order. For this system to be sustainable, these norms must be attached to the bodies of individual persons. Um, and I just realized I don't have a timer in front of me, so I'm gonna grab my phone just right behind me. Okay, so political units, um, I'm taking suggestions on this term, I guess. Um, it's a generalized term for formal and informal collectives. And I thought I got it from Peter Slaughter's essay in the Biopolitics Reader. Um, I don't really draw on his work anywhere else though. Um, it was just one of those moments where I was reading and like, oh, that's a good phrase for the thing to think about. Um, one of the things that we hear about in the context of a post-national order uh, is the end of the nation state, right? So since Epidurai's book, probably before that, significantly since then, people have written, definitely before that, um, people have written about the end of the nation state, that's the thing that's gonna happen soon. Um, and people have also been not so receptive to that. Uh, but the thing I think we can take seriously, um, I think we can still think about the idea of a post-national order in a productive way. So despite the fact that the nation state is not ending, we can still consider the heterogeneity of political units that constitute our polity. This directs us toward the idea of a post-national order. Epidurai writes that we should not conflate the nation state of Sri Lanka with Great Britain. The states that structure the world are already differentiated. And Habermas, for example, has argued that further breaking with homogeneity is an opportunity to create more equitable and transnational political structures. Even if the nation state or similar structures are not ending, we can take seriously the idea of a post-national order in order to consider what norms can and should structure a heterogeneous order of political units. So Apadurai writes, it may well be that the emergent post-national order proves not to be a system of homogeneous units, but a system based on relations between heterogeneous units. The challenge for this emergent order will be whether such heterogeneity is consistent with some minimal conventions of norm and value, which do not require a strict adherence to the liberal social contract of the modern West. What norm could structure a post-national order of heterogeneous units? Here is where Exit West's utopian moment becomes salient, both as a simple solution and as a means of normative critique. Exit West follows the young couple, Nadia and Saeed, as they travel through a series of mysterious doors to escape their home country, which is not named, uh, which is typical for Hamid, but described as an ambiguous Middle Eastern country driven to civil war by emerging militants. As violence takes over Nadia and Syed city, rumors have begun to circulate of doors that could take you elsewhere, often to places far away, well removed from this death trap of the country. A normal door could become a special door, and it could happen without warning to any door at all. Nadia and Syed travel through these doors to the Mykonos Island in Greece, to London, and eventually to Marin County in Northern California. Once they settle in Marin, Nadia and Saeed separate and Saeed joins a religious community. One that, in keeping with the new style, is not specifically named, but I think must be a community of Black Muslims in Africa. 
The novel's narrative tracks the breakdown of existing communities, it tracks the temporary emergence of new communities among migrants, and an idealist emergence of a post-national order or heterogeneous political units as people cope with a whole planet on the move. In this narrative of movement, what emerges is the importance of attaching specific norms to individual persons. The norm of democratic autonomy, that is the right to vote and some sort of polity, and freedom of movement. For normative and practical reasons, Exit West represents attaching these norms to individuals as capable of sustaining a post-national order. When Saeed joins the religious community at the end of the novel, some of its members are working to set up a plebiscite which sought a ballot on the question of the creation of a regional assembly for the Bay Area, with members elected on the principle of one person, one vote, regardless of where one came from. How this assembly would coexist with other pre-existing bodies of government was, yet, was as yet undecided. It might at first have only a moral authority, but that authority could be substantial, for unlike those other entities for which some humans were not given enough to exercise suffrage, this new assembly would speak from the will of all people and in the face of that will, it was hoped, greater justice might be less easily denied. So the idealism of the passage is quite clear. Uh, to create a, a society where no one is marginalized for not being human enough would be unprecedented in the modern era. Um, and for context, um, at the end of the novel, there is just a large community of immigrants living um, in a it's like an unstructured area of Marion County. Um, so they're people who like haven't been naturalized, um, come from all over the place. Um, so they need some sort of um, setup to integrate themselves. Um, so the idealism of this passage is anchored to the principle and practice of one person, one vote, because this is a practice that instantiates the norm of autonomy and judgment. Any polity that fosters the autonomy and judgment of its individual members can assert moral authority because autonomy holds status as a compelling norm in Western philosophy and political structure. Since Kant's moral philosophy, respect for autonomy has entailed respect for others, freedom to be a self. Even if this assembly has an unclear relationship with other already formalized polities, it cannot be dismissed because it appeals to this normative authority. As a result, the norm of autonomy is represented here as capable of sustaining an order of heterogeneous political units, an order of regional assemblies and cities and states and then some. Whatever shape and constitution a polity utilizes, if it appeals to autonomy, it can ideally cooperate with other units relying on the same norm. Historically, this ideal of autonomy has an unconvincing showing as a foundational norm for equitable politics. Instead of establishing the importance of a trait we all share, it has been integrated into naturalistic sciences um, and philosophies and politics to create distinctions between those determined by nature to be the possessors of reason and those predestined by it to remain enslaved to a lack of such reason, as Sylvia Winter puts it. Respect for autonomy is not very meaningful if other people conveniently lack it for some biological reason. And critics have classified Kant's anthropological works as falling into this latter category. So some countervailing force is required to put an end to these dehumanizing distinctions. Exit West offers this force with an image of technology. Following the previous passage, there is a description of a technological device that does the speculative work of utopian fiction. A member of Said's church shows him a little device that made it possible to tell one person from another and ensure they could vote only once, and it was being manufactured in vast numbers at a cost so small as to be almost nothing. Exit West does not take up the philosophical labor of redefining our common humanity. Instead, it uses technology to shore up a historically problematic, yet familiar and powerful norm in order to ground political participation within a community with nothing in common except having arrived. The device is an effective counter to exclusionary concept of humanity because it is something that can attach to any body. Although Exit West does not depart from the paradigm of autonomy as indicative of the self, by paying attention to the need for material production of this device, the novel does acknowledge the embodiment of those selves. 
the material challenge of civic participation, the challenge of giving embodied people a means to vote, is represented as the practical challenge standing in the way of a worthwhile norm. By ensuring civic participation according to a norm of autonomy, this little device offers itself as a technology capable of making the norms of a post-national order a practical reality. The other norm that Exit West represents as necessary for a post-national order is freedom of movement. If we want to prioritize movement in thinking about community, then the most relevant social and political unit to retain is the one that best indexes the movement. Prioritizing movement points us toward the individual again. The capacity for and comfort with movement are not necessarily the same across members of families, communities, friendships, or couples. So in the full chapter version, I give several examples uh, from the novel that show moments of individual breaking or departing from larger cultural units, uh, moments of individual movement, and the integration of individuals into new communities. Uh, I give one example of each here. The point of these examples is to show the importance of the individual person as a normative unit in a post-national order. Through its representation of migration, Exit West represents the individual person as a political unit with a normative function, a unit to which we should attach the rights of autonomy and movement. When Said and Nadia prepare to leave their unnamed city, they plan to take Said's father with them. At the last minute, Said's father says he will not go and the subsequent passage escalates from a tragic personal moment of departure into a theory of sustainable units of human life amidst catastrophe and migration. But Saeed's father was thinking also of the future, even though he did not say this to Saeed, for he feared that if he said this to his son, that his son would, might not go. And he knew above all else that his son must go. And what he did not say was that he had come to that point in a parent's life when, if a flood arrives, one knows one must let go of one's child, contrary to all the instincts one had when one was younger. Because holding on can no longer offer the child protection, it can only pull the child down and threaten them with drowning. For the child is now stronger than the parent, and the circumstances are such that the utmost strength is required. And the arc of a child's life only appears for a while to match the arc of a parent. In reality, one sits atop the other, a hill atop a hill, a curve atop a curve, and Saeed's father's arc now needed to curve lower while his sons still curved higher. For with an old man hampering them, these two young people were simply less likely to survive. At the beginning of the novel, Saeed lives with his parents. When his mother dies, killed by militants taking over their city, Nadia leaves it. Said's story feels like a story of an evolving family unit. And this collective unit evolves with the loss and addition of individual persons. Said's father seems to know this, seems to know it as the imminent tension of collectives amidst movement and catastrophe, revealing the fragility of arcs of life that briefly coincide but are not sustainable in every circumstance. Exit West uses Said's father to articulate the necessity of changing social units by letting go of individuals and letting collectives dissolve into individuals in times of catastrophic crisis. One critic interprets the form of Exit West's paragraph-long sentences as doing two kinds of work. Firstly, an aesthetics of connectivity by way of its clauses, commas, and conjunction, by way of mechanics that make connections between words possible. And secondly, by emphasizing ambiguity and uncertainty, about whether such connections are sustainable. This long passage deploys its aesthetics of connectivity to quite clearly say that there are some circumstances where connections are not sustainable. Points of breakage within collectives and their imminent possibility suggest the more reliable social unit to track is the individual person. Although Nadia and Saeed flee their city together, movement does not mean the same thing to them. By prioritizing movement, Exit West foreshadows their eventual separation. Nadia had been, and would afterwards continue to be, more comfortable with all varieties of movement in her life than with Saeed, in whom the impulse of nostalgia was stronger, perhaps because his childhood had been more idyllic, or perhaps because this was simply his temperament. Comfort with movement distinguishes individuals from one another. 
because persons vary by comfort with movement, any collective group may fracture when one person stops and another proceeds. Breakage and movement are not the only activities of individuals and collectives. Integration is also possible. In a chaotic world where anyone can be from anywhere, connections between individual persons have the capacity to sustain larger communities. In London, Said and Nadia live in a large house with many other migrants, mostly Nigerians, and the elders of this group form a council. Uh, it's like, it's implied that it's like a decision-making council for the group of people that live there. But it's not really clear like what power it has. It's not really flushed out. Um, the only important part is really like the scene I'm about to read. Uh, so as a result, the, consul the council um, has a conspicuously nationalist character, um, or national character. Uh, conspicuously, because Nadia is the only obvious non-Nigerian who attended. And the first time Nadia went, there was a silence. But then an old woman with a turban who lived with her daughter and grandsons in the bedroom above Saeed and Nadia, and whom Nadia had helped on more than one occasion to ascend the stairs. This old woman beckoned Nadia to come stand at her side. This seemed to settle the matter. There is a rather idealized reciprocity of kindness here, where one small act catalyzes another small but far more politically meaningful act later. I am unaware of whether any nation has ever sustained itself on something like this. Usually their founding myths are based on the opposite behavior. But Exit West represents this individual kindness as capable of sustaining a larger improvised community. Breakage, movement, and integration are not events that always separate individuals from one another. And such separations are not always permanent, as indicated by the cultural relevance of terms like family reunification and its pejorative double, chain migration. However, what I have tried to show in these examples is how Exit West represents the individual person as an ideal unit to attach rights to because circumstances may create conditions where migration is a solitary journey. As a result, the novel both affirms the politically normative value of autonomy, provided that the technology is there to back it up, and the norm of freedom of movement, and the single person as a normative unit in a post-national order. The original title of this talk references a critique of political units. If a post-national order is constituted by heterogeneous units, assemblies, cities, regions, nation states, then a critique of political units would analyze and evaluate how political units interfere with one another and determine the cost of interferences. I developed this with a lengthier reading of Habermas's proposal for a transnational democracy in Europe in the chapter version of this. Because uh, he kind of like already does that evaluative analysis without taking it, I think, um, in the direction I want to take it or taking it as far as it could go. Although Apadurai writes that the challenging question is whether a post-national order would be compatible with norms, of which autonomy is a typical example, this reading of Exit West suggests that it should also tolerate a normative political unit in the form of the individual. Exit West asserts the importance and stabilizing capacity of individual persons as political units that are mobile and capable of sustaining greater communities. What exactly such larger units look like would vary by context, but the critique that I tried to develop in the chapter is meant to help us decide. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful, Walter. Thank you. So, Sean, would you like to begin? Totally. Um, hello, everyone. My name's Sean. I hope you are all well. Um, let's see. First, I'd like to thank Professors Vint and Sheldon, and as well as Catherine Henshaw and CIS for putting this putting this together. Uh, I'm super excited. Um, so basically, uh, I've decided to read a paper. Um, and I'd like to start with a quote um, by Alfred Bester. Um, it's life is a freak. That's its hope and glory. Um, and the title of this paper is Energy Aesthetics in J.H. Rosnianais, La Mort de la Terre, or uh, The Death of the Earth. Okay, so the politics of this study is eventful. 
As Alam Badu explains, an event is an unpredictable occurrence that introduces a massive potential for change. An event necessitates fidelity by those magnetized by its force. Such fidelity is a process of subjectivization. It subjectivizes the subject faithful to the event, not the other way around. The event is outside. For Badiou, events may occur in mathematics, politics, the arts, and love. Some of his more famous examples are Cantor's set theory, the Paris Commune, Holderlin's poetry, and love understood as the encounter of the world from the perspective of difference. Badiou's theory of the event is so generous that one might even think of a falling leaf as an event. For this study, the event is the Anthropocene. As Frederick Nayrat argues, the Anthropocene may be characterized as a concern for the formation of the terrestrial environment. The history of the colonial racial reality is characterized as a concern for the formation of Anthropos, man with a capital M. Following Andreas Malm, Alf Hornborg, Donna Haraway, Jason W. Moore, and many others, the ostensibly unifying Anthropos of the Anthropocene risks occulting the colonial racial reality and the environmental devastation caused by its imperialist drive to mine from within the capitalist economy of use and exchange, what Malm calls fossil capital, a triangular relation between capital, labor, and a certain segment of extra human nature in which the exploitation of labor by capital is impelled by the metamorphosis of fossil fuels into CO2. And the colonial racial reality structures the non-white, non-European, non-straight, non-male as an object of exchange value, a non-human commodity. Capitalism and colonial racial violence are circularly related. This circle coincides with an isomorphism shared between the Anthropocene and the colonial racial reality. The condition of this isomorphism following John Solomon is the logic of species difference, human non-human. The emphasis, or rather overemphasis, on fiction about oil in literary studies in the energy humanities repeats the colonial racial reality's ecologically devastating use of oil. Some examples are Stephanie Le, Le Menager's Living Oil, Ross Barrett and Daniel Warden's Oil Culture, and Christopher F. Jones's Routes of Power. This overemphasis is a variant, variant of what Jones self-consciously identifies as petromyopia an anthropocentric perspective that views oil as an easy, limitless resource. Petromyopia is speciesist insofar as it presumes that the capacity for rationality supposedly unique to sapient humans um, is a sufficient reason to exploit non-human nature. Thus, petromyopia is isomorphic to the colonial and racial violence that structures the non-white, non-European, irrational, and ultimately non-human, non-straight, non-male as the easy limitless energy resource of its opposite, the structural ontology of Anthropos, the white European rational human man with a capital M. This violent commodification of energy precludes the development of expenditures of energy outside the capitalist economy of use and exchange. Unsurprisingly, there is no concentrated study of energy aesthetics in the energy humanities because aesthetics is often taken to be apolitical or useless. This study seeks to correct this gap in scholarship by considering how the aesthetics of weird literature may gift us energy resistant to easy use. Before I examine Francophone Belgian author J.H. Rosny Anne's novella, La Mort de la Terre, to qualify this claim, some definitional work is in order. Aesthetics is understood in this study to be an epistemology of world-making. World-making, as explained by Nelson Goodman, is the capacity of art to employ symbols in the making of worlds. It's a capacious definition of aesthetics, and for this reason I use it. It may be this said that aesthetics is a functionalist epistemology, a literary work, a work of art is what it does, which is make worlds. It's important to add that for Goodman, artworks accept a plurality of incommensurately correct interpretations. Nonetheless, artworks can't be identified with interpretations of them, so Goodman's aesthetics is plural, pluralist and relativist, and relativism poses a great threat to us. As Badiou says, il y a un seul, seul monde, there is only one world, in defining energy while affirming pluralism and negating relativism, let's make four affirmations. And this is gonna be like super quick because in the dissertation, there's tons of stuff, so I'm happy to talk about this uh, in addition to it, but yeah. So the four affirmations are energy is a material multiple, it's radically contingent, it's on the side of the object, and it's a reclamation of nature's separation from society. So energy aesthetics is a functionalist epistemology of employing symbols to make post-sustainable worlds that revel in the sovereign expenditure of energy. Literary works that realize energy aesthetics accept the plurality of interpretations. 
but in committing to the Anthropocene event, it's my subjective decision that the only correct interpretations of them are incompatible with the circular relationship shared between capitalism and colonial racial violence. And this circles correlation with the circular relationship shared between the Anthropocene and the colonial racial reality, whose condition of possibility, again, is the logic of species difference. I've already commenced the objective modeling of an alterity withdrawn from self-other correlations. By singularizing energy aesthetics, I've therefore commenced the objective modeling of a non-relational relational ontology. So what's post-sustainability? As Alan Stokel theorizes vis-a-vis -vis Georges Bataille, post-sustainability rejects the notion of nature as an easy limitless resource. Instead, finding energy in acts of waste, acts that draw limitless energy from an infinitely generous inhuman sun, throwing us violently to the limit of a cosmic time belonging to no one. Stokel writes, thus post-sustainability. Sustainability not as a definitive knowledge in and as a final unalterable historical moment, but rather a knowledge as non-knowledge. Practice is the end of practice, the affirmation of nature, including its fossil fuel energy reserves, that refuses to see it simply as a thing, as a concatenation of energy inputs that need only be managed. Rather, nature is what sustains itself when we sustain ourselves not as conservers, but as spenders, not of stockpiled energy, but of the energy of the universe, as Bataille would put it, that courses through our bodies, above us, below us, and hurls us in anguish into communication with the violence, the limit of time. The post-sustainable economy is a general economy, beyond the desires and needs of the human particle. It entails the affirmation of resources conserved and energy spent on a completely different scale. Rejecting mechanized waste, the world offers itself as sacred victim. For Bataille, who's the only 20th century philosopher to explicitly foreground energy, it's thus an ethical concept. As demonstrated by Sokol, important to Bataille in post-sustainability is his Saudian theory of base materialism, a materialism so heterogeneous, so formless, and so cursed that the notions of self and society, let alone their correlation, are altogether evacuated. Sovereign acts express based materialism and the energy expended by them can't be appropriated by any homogenous system, for example, capitalism, ontology, science, etc. Rather, the energy expended and the base materialism communicated through sovereign acts are precisely what ground a homogenous system. In its heterogeneity, its formlessness, its cursedness, base materialism is excluded. For Bataille, sovereign acts are self-destructive. Through mindless waste, the self foregoes capitalist accumulation and sacrifices itself to an open-ended social generosity, to give without expectation of return to waste. This gifting points the way to an energy outside the capitalist logic of sustainability, a logic defeated by the reality of anthropocenic energy exhaustion. As Stokel um, decrypts, sustainability implies that we can conserve and use energy resources in such a way that they'll never be depleted. In this way, sustainability, like the Hegelian master that insists on the limitless energy of the slave, surreptitiously insists on the limitlessness of fossil fuels. We instead find in Bataille's general economy a secular cult, a satanic mass of self-destruction. As Stokel writes, the broken self, the ipsa, like cursed matter, is inseparable from the energy that binds and that is released by, that devours the society that Bataille envis envisages for the future. This reannihilation is a, or rather reannihilation, is a sovereign expenditure of energy, an absolute negation whereby self and society are lost to, lost to one another in the vertiginous flight of the spleen, opening perhaps the way to what Stokel calls a mythical utopia of generosity, a communism. Bataille's perhaps installs a contingency, a fear and a trembling at the core of his structural ontology. Bataille wants to amplify the noise of sovereignty, its terrible wasteful poison, so what he aspires is radically outside egalitarianism and universal justice. So I'm now gonna examine Rosny's novella, uh, La Mort de la Terre, as a weird literary work that realizes energy aesthetics so that I may explicate the use, usefulness, or rather uselessness, according to the capitalist economy, of the energy it gifts us. The novella describes the desertification of a future earth plagued by earthquakes as the consequence of the exploitation of fossil fuels. Humans have adapted to the planet's rarefied atmosphere and lack of food by evolving large chests and narrow abdomens. In the face of seemingly inevitable extinction, they become largely dispassionate. Birds have flourished. We also learn of the ferromagnetics, iron-based life forms that were generated by human industry. For a time, humanity thought they could exploit the ferromagnetics and derive energy from them. However, it became evident that the ferromagnetic substance, itself inaccessible to science, was harmful to humans. The ferromagnetics, without antagonism, drain the iron from the blood of any nearby human. 
it then became evident that humans needed to expend massive amounts of energy to stop the ferromagnetic proliferation. What few humans remain harness technology to create impenetrable interconnected oases where they limit procreation and practice population control through euthanasia. Throughout the novella, we follow Targ, who, unlike his peers who spurn hope in a future world hospitable to human life, passionately searches for and eventually discovers a new source of water. But this discovery merely delays certain doom as continuing earthquakes drain what water remains. As the ferromagnetics occupy the oases, Targ becomes the last carbon-based life form on the planet. No matter what, he'll die. And the rest of humanity will die. At the novel's conclusion, or novella's conclusion, Targ, the universal last man, Anthropos, rejects euthanasia and descends among the ferromagnetics in his home oases, lays down alongside them, and dies. His decision to reject euthanasia and commit suicide by allowing the ferromagnetics to drain the iron from his blood doesn't reflect a nihilistic resignation or even a choice. It reflects an ecological sensitivity useful when confronting the multidimensional horror of the Anthropocene. As our Scott Backer explains, the nature of choice obliterates our intellectual and phenomenological intuitions regarding choice. There's just no such thing. In trying to understand Targ's decision, our attention is drawn to the nature of choice itself, and we come to discover that choice has always simply been ecological sensitivity. Let's consider the last line of the novel. Um, so I'm going to read both the French and the English um, for this part. So uh, the French is ensuite une demande quelques parcelles de la dernière vie humaine entrèrent dans la vie nouvelle. And then the English is then humbly, a few small pieces of the last human life entered into the new life. As argued by Danielle Chat Chatelain and George Slusser, Rosny's selection of parcel, which means a small part of something, is unique, especially when contrasted with his previous selection of particule, a small part, when referring to Targ's alienation from terrestrial life. During a journey into the depths of the earth where Targ discovers new water, Rosny writes, he was a captive of the mineral realm, a small thing infinitely weak, which a single stone could pulverize. And in the French there, he uses the, the word particule. For Chaplain uh, Chat and Slusser, the movement from particule to parcelle implies the larger context of what we call today an ecological system. This post-humanism in its implication of a partitive article is sovereign in the battalion sense. And so here's the energy the novella gives us to consider the possibility, even for a moment, that an absolute negation whereby self and society are lost to one another will perhaps culminate in a future world of egalitarianism and justice. We can thus say that la mort de la terre, in gifting us energy via Targ's sovereign act of suicide, his self-destructive waste of life, is post-sustainable. So I agree with Mark Fisher that it's easier to end the world or to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. But I mean, it's more difficult, according to the capitalist economy of use and exchange that exploits non-humans, to imagine the end of the world and the end of capitalism. Rosny teaches us that to live at the end of the world for humans is to hold out for the possibility that future human-non-human co-evolution might occur. So I want to ask what norm can we construct with this energy? Energized by Rosny's novella, we first weird world literature to borrow Timothy S. Murphy's language. Murphy explains that national literatures which express the essence of their respective peoples are metaphysically prior to world literature, which can only arise afterward at the conclusion of history through a logic of hostile conflict, dialectical struggle, and ultimately pacification through synthesis, as Kojev's reading of Hegel pretty much. Contra national literature and world literature, Murphy theorizes vis-a-vis -vis Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari geo-literature, which draws from a world logic in which relations are prior to their terms. For Murphy, H.P. Lovecraft's weird fiction is an example of geo-literature because it projects an ancient, radically different world beneath our world, destabilizing the political world of national slash imperialist identity. Eschewing the capitalist identitarian's parochial elevation of internationalism, geo-literature instead marks its ungrounding, deformation, displacement, and abolition. For Murphy, the aim of geo-literature is to transform world literature into weird literature, to critique through an encounter with the cosmic, the subject of the nation state. Let us finally say then that it just doesn't matter that La Mort de la Terre, an example of geo-literature that ungrounds, deforms, displaces, and abolishes humanity, was written by a Francophone Belgian author. What matters is what we do with the real worlds it makes. In Rosny's novella, there are two references that anticipate Targ's sovereign act of suicide. First lost underground, he is briefly overtaken by the ferromagnetics, and the omniscient narrator refers to the consequent pleasant sensation he feels. Quote, not only did he feel no pain whatsoever, but the sensation turned out to be almost pleasant. 
It was a sort of vertigo, a slight and slow intoxication, which must resemble euthanasia, but isn't. Such vertige, such glisserie, discloses the sovereign act of the human-non-human -human fusion and subsequently releases uh, what's a resurgence of energy. That, and, and that's a quote um, from the English translation, that impels Tar to push onward in his search for water. Second, following his home oasis' decision to commit mass suicide in response to the loss of water, Targ asserts and, ex and exclaims, certainly the two kingdoms were closer to each other than either was to the inert mineral world. Who knows whether their forms of consciousness in time would not have understood each other. These two citations help us understand Targ's decision to reject euthanasia and commit suicide by allowing himself to merge with the ferromagnetics. He has felt firsthand the sensation that accompanies the energy released by such emerging. Furthermore, although he admits that the sensation must, and that's another quote, must resemble euthanasia, he implies that it is, that he implies and is interested in its inherent difference, its, ex, its expenditure of energy that might lead to la vie nouvelle, the new life. The corrosive universalism of l'amour de la terre doesn't therefore entail the elimination of difference. Rather, it's precisely because of its universalism that the novella is capable of instituting a non-relativist and differential pluralism useful when thinking the Anthropocene, which may be thought as an in itself or noumenon apart from mind. The Anthropocene is real, global warming is real, yeah. To repeat, however, the Anthropocene event risks obscuring the colonial racial reality, which is also real, and the environmental devastation caused by its latter's imperialist drive to mine non-humans for fossil capital, which is also real. In Rosny's novella, the anthropogenic eco-disaster is similarly real, but the ecological sensitivity demonstrated by Targ's suicide is conditioned by the recognition of the colonial racial reality and its creation of the ferromagnetics that have come to supplant humanity's role in shaping the terrestrial environment. The novella thus generously treats as given the equality of humans and non-humans, and as an example of weird literature, the post-humanist gesture the novella makes at the possibility of future human-non-human coevolution taking place at a mineral level reflects a differential pluralism close to Rosny's own philosophy of difference, which he outlines in Les Sciences et le Pluralisme. Um, so there he writes, there can be no unity in difference, or if difference is essential to the constitution of things, but there can be any number of resemblances, resemblances of every order, different resemblances, resemblances, so to speak, in an indefinitely varied and variable universe. It, it's essentially like a, a structuralist vitalism. It follows that the condition of Rosny's energy aesthetics is a radically multiple and contingent reality, a battalion based materialism, a differential pluralism. Rosny, in other words, apprehends as a universal truth the absence of unity to reality or as Chatelaine and Slusser explain, quote, he sees evolution in terms of an ecosystem, the complex and neutral interaction of independent biotic and abiotic factors in a particular location, that of Earth itself. Rosny's weird literature therefore allows us to think the Anthropocene is a cosmic event that refers to a differential pluralism itself impelling the unification of the local and the universal while sustaining their differences. So by way of conclusion, let's say that the local and the universe, or rather, let's say that la mort de la terre suggests we ought to welcome, if not accelerate, human extinction, because it might lead to a communism whose conditions are the equality of humans and non-humans. What we do with this norm, of course, will take place in social space. We might even arrive at the recognition that this thought was only made available to us by, our way, by way of our progressive undertaking of accountability for ourselves as a species. So we agree here with Thomas Moynihan, Quote, recollecting the story of how we came to care about our own extinction helps to establish precisely why we must continue to care and care now as never before, insofar as the oncoming century is to be the riskiest thus far. Rosny's novella in energizing us to think a future world without the structural ontology of Anthropos is a part of this story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Terrific. Summer, are you prepared to carry the torch onward? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, and also, it's kind of hard for me to gauge if I'm speaking loud enough because I'm just kind of feel like I'm speaking to myself in my house. So just let me know if I need to talk louder or slow down. Um, but just to echo Sean, thank you for tuning in to the Zoom conference. And a special thank you to Cheryl and Catherine for organizing the speculative fiction panel. Um, and to Dr. Sheldon for agreeing to be a respondent. It's all very exciting. So my presentation today is meant to share and get feedback on my current research, out of which I'm hoping to develop my dissertation, to give some brief context to the larger project. I'm interested in the question of why we should take speculative aesthetics and narrative seriously as a form of political testimony, historiography, and critical theory, rather than just a form of highly imaginative fiction, though as I hope to show in this presentation, that is nonetheless central to its unique conceptual force. Um, so this presentation specifically developed out of a quandary that has bothered me um, as I've begun to explore the political potential of the speculative, specifically in our contemporary moment. And that quandary is the way a lot of the interventions made by speculative studies and its brother in feminist science studies, such as the emphasis of theorists like Donna Haraway and Sandra Harding on science is necessarily coming from a subjective standpoint, could now be seen as in alignment with or potential at the risk of being co-opted by the Trump administration's post-truth approach to scientific facts, political claims, and public discourse. So a theorist who has been tremendously helpful for me in working through this quandary is the Black Studies scholar Tavia Nongo, particularly his 2018 book, Afrofabulations, The Queer Drama of Black Life. Um, and what she also kind of pursues this question of the political potential or purpose of the speculative or the fabulous. So in Afrofabulations, Nyango uses the concept of critical fabulation, which I'm framing here as closely aligned with how I'm thinking about speculative aesthetics to analyze the political meaning of Black performance art and film. So to slightly distinguish it from the speculative, Critical fabulation is a concept specifically developed within Black studies, first coined by Sadia Hartman, whose work I'll touch on later. Um, so critical fabulation emphasizes the performative nature of the act of fabulation as a form of critical, critical theorizing and how its imaginative nature forces a rethinking of dominant forms of being, knowing and relating. And also because of its performative nature, um, it's used to kind of resist being made fully legible and resist the captivity of official archives and academic institutions whose structures of knowing and documenting, particularly in relation to marginalized knowledges, are often more about replicating specific power structures than actually encouraging critical thought and illumination. So in Afrofabulations, Nyong'o turns to Black performance art and film that fabulates in the context of the self, such as performance artists and filmmakers who use their work to imagine themselves in different identities and bodies, as well as work that fabulates in the context of historical events, such as films that fabulate based on the imaginaries of slavery and plantation life. So within the context of art that fabulates through imaginaries laden with political contention and that may speak to such issues as identity politics or the case for reparation, um, the conceptual force of fabulation for Nyong'o derives from how it, quote, is tethered to the classic paradox of fiction. The matter of why and how it is that a story we know to be untrue can nonetheless inspire belief, emotion, and attachment, end quote. So critical, fabulous art thus engages with the emotional, affective, and theoretical weight of marginalized forms of storytelling that have often been positioned as unreal or imaginary in their relation to ruling realities. So a second key point of Nyong'o's work, and one that I find particularly useful in thinking through the relation of critical fabulation to post-truth, is how a critical turn to fabulation does not mean we simply embrace the fabulous side of the truth fiction binary, but rather that studying acts of fabulation should be done with an eye to their potential to both disrupt and bring attention to the regimes of authority that have historically determined whose and what kind of stories get positioned as fantasy or mendacity within discursive fields of truth and fact. Critical fabulation thus interrogates not only the reality of the imaginings of marginalized subjects, but also the fantastic nature of what passes for objective reality. This critical dimension Nyong'o's approach to fabulation allows him to dismiss the argument that shifting to fabulation is a mode of theorizing, risk further consolidating the post-truth leanings of the public sphere under the Trump administration. He argues that such a critique, quote, 
badly mistakes, oppositional performative strategies that have emerged from the margins as being the same as, or even comparable to, the enduring powers of propaganda that have long occupied the center. It blames those who have been victimized by empowered fictions for inventing counter mythologies of their own." End quote. So I find that particularly helpful because when I was first getting interested in speculative thought, I did feel some academic guilt or pressure to defend that interest through what we might call enlightenment style reasoning, such as emphasizing the way in which speculative works develop out of more credited or official scientific or academic research and not just out of the imagination. And I think I felt this pressure, particularly in light of current concerns about post-truth politics um, and the defunding of scientific institutions. But Afrofabulations helped teach me that the way out of this post-truth crossroads does not have to be either doubling down on the enlightenment standards of knowledge that disciplines like feminist science studies and speculative studies have worked so hard to critique, or abandoning rigorous critical thought and scholarship's elitist, but rather this could be an opportunity for a scholars to pursue new forms of scholarship, such as critical fabulation, so a key question I'm pursuing is what would it mean if critical fabulation was not only incorporated, but in fact prioritized in academia precisely for its ability to disrupt the entanglement between institutional knowledges and the obfuscating nature of power. So currently I'm pursuing this question by looking to Black Studies articulations of speculative aesthetic and narrative modes that perform critical fabulation. So I'll just give um, a brief overview of scholars who have been helpful to my project so far and how I read their work in relation to critical fabulation, particularly as performed the very form of scholarship. So one scholar who's been very influential on my project is Sadia Hartman, whose work very broadly centers on the archive and representations of slavery. Her most well-known article, Venus in Two Acts, dissects her failed attempts to write a fictional account of slavery and in turn uses that as a jumping off point to interrogate the risk and motives for fictionalized representations of lost histories. Her work is particularly concerned with how representations of anti-Black violence, such as slave films, are often more exploitive than critical in their approach to retelling history. Her latest work, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, Intimate Histories of Social Upheaval, expands on her interest in Venus in Two Acts by taking vestiges of Black life in official 20th century archives, such as criminal records or national newspapers, and providing a speculative imagining to the lives gestured to outside of their minimal and often criminalized representation in those official archives. And what's significant to me, particularly in the context of my project about Wayward Lives, is how so much of Hartman's intervention is performed through the form of the book rather than just the information it presents. Her poetic writing style and her speculative imaginings helps give the lost vibrancy of lives deemed wayward, while her meta reflections throughout on the ways in which her retellings of lost histories are necessarily speculative and incomplete exemplify how incorporating the speculative and the fabulous in critical theory can provide a crucial rejoinder to the often smug, self-assured, and formulaic stylings of much academic prose. So just to give you a taste of what I mean, in her introduction to Wayward Lives, Hartman describes her intended intervention, noting how she, quote, prefers to think of this book as the fugitive text of the wayward, and it is marked by the errantry that it describes. In this spirit, I have pressed at the limits of the case file and the document, speculated about what might have been, imagined the things whispered in dark bedrooms, and amplified moments of withholding, escape and possibility, moments when the vision and dreams of the wayward seem possible. So again, an important aspect of critical fabulation is this emphasis on searching for a sort of truth about a subject of critical interest, in Hartman's case, 20th century Black domestic life, while using the performative to avoid replicating the structures of captivity and surveillance that have historically determined the relationship between marginalized or criminalized lives and institutions of knowledge production and archiving. So another scholar who's been central to my project so far is Alexis Pauline Gums. She's a poet, a Black feminist scholar and activist, and like Hartman, much of her work combines creative and academic writing styles, which I argue illustrates how radical form is central to radical thought. Her 2018 book, M Archive, After the End of the World, accordingly resists easy categorization. Formally, it's organized much like a poetry book with short chapters that exhibit a stanza-like form. However, it is also academic in the sense that each section is heavily footnoted. 
um, Gums refers to it as a speculative documentary in the introduction. The narrative itself is most obviously speculative in nature, featuring a black feminist scientist slash archivist navigating her way through a post-apocalyptic earth. Her narration serves to document the refuse of the end of the world and the reasons why it ended. As a text, M. Archive is poetic in style and imagery, but also intensely theoretical in how it uses the post-apocalyptic setting to critique current social structures, such as late capitalism and anti-blackness, that make contemporary life unsustainable and are in fact leading to the end of the world. So again, to give you a taste, in what section the narrator describes how, quote, the prison tattoo artists were ahead of the game. They knew without having to spell it out that the body was the home that mattered, that matter was the muscle of home. No matter that this too, this very flesh, could be repossessed. Well, it didn't matter, and how much more important than the ink signs of permanence, the reverence for becoming gods with the most beautiful talent for rebirth marks. So this section obviously serves as to comment and highlight the prison industrial complex, and I in turn think it's really interesting how Gums performs her critique and intervention through her poetic framing of prison tattoo artist is actually, quote, ahead of the game and how they knew to record their stories and connections on the impermanent vessel of the body because after the end of the world, that was all survivors were left with. Much of M Archive's narrative in turn critiques have the more common preoccupation with imaginary forms of capitalist value making, such as mortgages, led to the end of the world and left the survivors helpless. So the structure of M Archive's political critique I think speaks to the twin functions of critical fabulation is both using a fabulous imagination to provide a more fully fleshed out performative representation of marginalized life, as well as providing a critical perspective on reified for forms of being and knowing. So the last scholar I'll point out is offering an academic method of critical fabulation is Terry Pickens, whose recent book, Black Madness, Mad Blackness, provides close readings of mad black characters and speculative fiction works by authors such as Octavia Butler, Neil Hopkinson, and Matt Johnson. What I find particularly important about her methodology in mad Black Madness in relation to critical fabulation is how she is particularly focused on the formal breaks with linear logics of narration enforced by the less plottable ways of being inhabited by mad characters. She argues that such formal breaks speak to how madness resists the frame or disciplining of the narrative form and consequently forces the reader to grapple with the boundaries of representation as well as the sanest, ableist, and white assumptions of the human and its attendant stories that are tied up with common forms of narrative representation, such as the novel. Pickens in turn argues for the urgency of critical mad studies, particularly for how it both resists and draws attention to the sanest assumptions of academia, which trace back to the imperialist logics of man as described by Sylvia Winter. In Pickens' consideration of how the appearance of madness in writing disrupts ruling formal structures, she describes how, quote, it is not coincidental that much of the work on madness comes from the fields of rhetoric and composition, because so many of the narratives we embrace about madness viewed as a fundamental issue of communication. These scholars intervene in the sacralized understanding of madness is uncommunicative and therefore unripe for analysis. Madness and blackness exert pressure on all modes of critical analysis, forcing an examination of how we place the human at the center or overlook it as the default premise, end quote. So critical mad studies is this less about articulating kind of a clear central purpose of madness in relation to contemporary questions, then it's about the performative disruption of ruling structures of critical analysis, much like critical fabulation. Pickens emphasizes throughout Mad Blackness that she is not interested in drawing clear conclusions, as is often the honest of the academic monograph. She is rather interested in problematizing the stage structures of academia from a mad black perspective. So I'll end my presentation by briefly pointing to some creative writers and filmmakers that I'm interested in for using on my own project on speculative aesthetics. So to start with speculative literature, one field of writing I'm particularly interested in exploring is queer, feminist, and trans rewritings of fairy tales by authors such as Angela Carter, Helen Oyami, Carmen Maria Machado, and Daniel Lavery. These authors use the moralized format and trappings of the fairy tale to play with and question ideas of evil, darkness, power, and obedience in ways that I argue critically interrogate disciplinary structures of heteropatriarchy.
In Daniel Lavery's Rewriting to Fairy Tales and The Merry Spinster, for instance, he plays with the standard gender pronouns of the most well-known fairy tales to draw attention to the gendered structure of those fairy tales that has previously naturalized. And in Helen Oyami's fairy tale, she similarly draws a special attention to the colonial and imperial underwritings of uh, common fairy tales by drawing narrative attention to the enforcement of national boundaries and the importance of national identities to the characters. So I'm in turn interested in thinking through why the moralized format of the fairy tale in particular is fruitful for critical fabulation and why these authors turn to it for, I would argue, similar political reasons. So there's also several contemporary filmmakers who are using fabulation and the speculative genre in really interesting and theoretically productive ways. I'm particularly interested in the work of Claire Denise, Yorgos Lanthimos, and Bong Joon-ho, because I think all three use speculative aesthetics specifically to critique oppressive regimes of power. Claire Denise, for example, grew up in colonial French Africa, and a lot of her work explores her early introduction to interest in colonial relations while also traversing different genres. Her latest film, High Life, is her first foray into the sci-fi slash space film genre, and like M Archive, I would argue, uses that genre specifically to comment on structures of racialization and incarceration. I also think Denise is particularly useful to think through besides the work of Lanthimos and Jun Ho, because they all demonstrate fabulous leanings throughout their work, but at the same time, they traverse multiple genres and their works resist easy categorization which I would argue is because they're less committed to fitting a certain genre than to the act of fabulation and its kind of political potential. All three also share this interesting thread of animality or animal characters throughout their works, and I think that speaks to their shared interest in the specifically biopolitical leanings of contemporary power structures. So I'm interested in thinking about why critical fabulation in film, um, specifically as a visual and visceral meeting, works well for critical fabulations of biopolitics. And that's all I have for today, but I thank everyone for listening to me and for coming to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rebecca, would you like to begin us to segue us toward comments and questions with your responses? Yes. Um, so thank you uh, to um, to Cheryl and to Catherine for um, putting this on and um, for inviting me to come and listen and to the three panelists for your very generous remarks today. Um, it's such a pleasure to hear you. Um, I think it's especially a pleasure to hear you. What, can you hear me, first of all? Good, okay. Um, I think it's especially a pleasure to hear you given where um, we are right now, which is to say in a moment that feels quite stretched to me. Um, and uh, I, by that I mean something like liminal, but maybe something also like an event, um, but maybe also something like a catastrophe, <laughs> but maybe also something like without excuse, right? But we don't know what we're looking at in the future. We don't know what kind of remuneration we might ever get again for doing this work. So we are where we are all the time anyway, which is only left with ourselves and our thoughts and our community and our love for each other. So it's being here and, and being generous with each other by, by doing the work of thinking um, that we create a world together. And I heard all of those themes in the works that you presented. Um, I um, was very interested um, in the way that norms kept reappearing in the papers. Um, so the, I think the, um, uh, Walter and Sean both um, explicitly uh, used that term, norms. That's uh, an interesting, that's just by itself is an interesting fact to pay attention to because um, uh, Norms have not always had uh, the happiest itinerary in critical literary studies. <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, a couple of years back, there was an issue of um, differences called um, queer theory without anti-normativity, which really marked a certain kind of end of anti-normativity as the critical consensus. Um, but I think it feels especially urgent and timely maybe even au courant right now um, to think about norms. 
because so much of that anti-normative perspective that accompanied that high moment of post-structural or queer theorizing was about a relationship to what felt like an entrenched, interminable um, uh, system of racialized capital extraction. And it felt like that was never going to move. <laughs> like what we needed to do was to overturn existing orders to, in order to create catastrophes essentially, in order to get out of the um, bind, um, however long you marked that bind, right? 300 years, a thousand years, <laughs> wherever you begin <laughs> um, that story. Um, and here I'm thinking just as a side note about Catherine Yosef's um, wonderful forerunners book, A Billion Black Anthropocenes, that really does have this kind of historical long durée as one of its primary concerns. So I think that part of the return to norms here that, uh, that you all are invoking and that, is, that, was sort of, that I see as sort of having built over the last decade has to do with the end of a kind of critical mission to transgress. That we don't um, have a particular um, feeling or urge. It no longer feels like the thing to do with our work to dis to dis to um, disinter from under a kind of operative ideology the real circumstances of people's lives, to expose it to them, um, and therefore to um, sort of force people with our writing to adapt different positions. I just don't think anyone thinks that's reasonable or desirable or necessary anymore. <laughs> We're all very aware of the conditions of exploitation that are happening around us. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's really interesting that norms have come up in each of your papers, um, but that their norms, they're not, they're, you know, for as much as Walter in particular talked about worms, worms talked about norms of political units, you know, the post-national community, um, I think it's really interesting that what they came down to was really something like generosity um, in Walter's paper, um, uh, uh, kindness, <laughs> um, even the kindness of self-sacrifice in Sean's paper. Um, Sean, I, I thought it was remarkable the way that you made Bataille sound so warm and fuzzy. <laughs> Whereas I mostly associate Patai with a certain kind of uh, lust for cruelty. But I think you're right. There is a certain way in which that solar excess that Patai describes is also a kind, of, uh, a kind of generosity, a kind of abundance. Um, that is, as you say, about spending and giving and wasting rather than about conserving and saving. These feel like especially important moments for us to remember, norms for us to remember in light of the kind of recent um, storm of hoarding that's happened, especially around toilet paper, um, and the return to our domestic interiors as a kind of condition of public health awareness, um, given the way that those function in the post-apocalyptic imaginary around a particular kind of patriarchal heterodomesticity. And I think that your will, Sean, to, um, to uh, valorize the social um, in its wastefulness and its self-sacrifice and its abundance is a good reminder that surviving has stakes, right? And that extinction um, as an operative principle, or at least as an accepted position, potential position, um, can offer different kinds of political possibilities. And Summer, in your piece, I thought that, um, you know, you didn't use the, t I don't remember you using norms particularly, but I thought your piece was in some ways really, you know, just beautifully finishing out the line of thinking that Walter and Sean began for us. Because um, Sean ended um, by saying, um, what matters is what we do with the world speculative fiction creates. Um, and Summer, you so beautifully picked up on that and asked us to really think about what it is that we're doing um, as readers and writers, right? How it is that we might um, think, uh, I always think of this, this line that I love dearly from M Archive, a book I, 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 I keep very close to me. In fact, it's, it's, it's uh, right here. <laughs> Um, uh, she says, um, what we wanted 
was to want to. What we wanted was to want to. And we had so long been accustomed to force that we had forgotten what it meant to want. So I thought this was a really beautiful, um, though you didn't cite this section, I thought that the invocation of gums was a really beautiful um, sort of completion of that move from kindness to social generosity, and then to wanting or pleasure or desire, right? Things that I think in this moment when, I don't know about you, but I'm not getting a lot of touch. Um, <laughs> pleasure, desire, social generosity, kindness, wanting, these things feel very at home to me, right? Very necessary, very urgent. Much more urgent than transgression, much more urgent than critique, much more urgent than exposure, right? So I guess what I want to open up for you all, especially, you know, because you all are, um, I get to say this now because I'm, because I, because <laughs> I feel old. <laughs> um, now, now that we're talking to this younger generation of scholars <laughs> in the field of speculative studies, I, I'm, I really want to ask you, you know, how do we employ these norms? Um, how do we, um, embrace them in our, you know, in our everyday practices of writing and critique? of studenting and professing, um, of reading and loving what we read, right? So what does it look like as scholarship? And I think, um, you know, Summer has really set us off on that path, also problematized it for us beautifully by explaining the ways in which, um, you know, the, an effective basis for the scholarly, whether it's kindness or cruelty, is also what's happening at the, the sort of most federal political levels, where we get a rationality that's generated around um, feeling. That feeling is often victimization and resentment, but nonetheless feeling, right? So what's the, what are the, um, you know, affordances of thinking about scholarship around affect, doing scholarship as a form of world building um, that, uh, uh, and care and kindness and, and generosity? Um, but also, you know, what are the potential um, problems with that kind of mode? This is a thing that I've been thinking about for a long time now. Um, especially in the very um, sort of, in, in some ways, nuts and bolts, compositional problem. Um, so I was so glad, Summer, that you brought up composition studies, because um, that feels very close to all of this, um, of just, you know, how do you write? Yeah, how do you write arguments that aren't arguments? Do you? Can you? Can you write arguments as creative? Does that lose the argumentative value of creativity? Does that lose the creativity of arguments? I mean, how do you, can we really do that? Is that really a thing? Or do we, do we then wind up all just being artists, right? Isn't there some role for argument, for persuasion? Um, you know, and, and I think connected to that, you know, there is a problem with norms, right? Um, Post-structuralism and high queer theory, we're not wrong about that. <laughs> Part of the problem of norms is that it relies on legibility. Yeah, you want a political unity, um, even if that political unit is the individual, um, it relies on an idea that there's a shared, legible, transparent language by which we all buy into that same norm. Which, you know, is, is maybe amenable to the kind of archive as gossip that Tavia Nyango talks about, but maybe isn't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I, I'm enough of a throwback that I'm not sure that I really think that we can start with norms. I don't know. I'm, I, I see very clearly that transgression is not where we're at, but I'm not sure that I think norms are where we should be either. So I, I'm troubled by that in my own writing and thinking. Um, so I invite you to help me either trouble these terms or build on them. Um, but really the, the core of my comments is just, you know, how, how do we do this work, right? How do we really do criticism as generosity, criticism as kindness? How do we build with the speculative worlds and, and why speculation in particular, right? Why, why is the speculative mode the one in which we get closest to bringing together um, affect and rationality or argument and artistry or something like that? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a back seat. I know um, the panelists no doubt have things to say and the, I'm sure the audience members do as well. Um, Catherine, are you going to take over the moderation or Cheryl or shall I? Do you mind just continuing on? Sure, I, I um, guess I would say then we can maybe let the, um, the panelists have the first round 
And then um, as people want to jump, chime in with questions or comments, I, I'm, I think that I, well, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I feel like we could all have a pretty generative conversation that doesn't have to be Q&A exactly. We wanna go in that route. Um, but if you can just sort of raise your hand um, at, when you want to go and then I'll, I'll, I'll make a list. Is that, does that seem right, Cheryl? I just wanted to jump in and say, if you don't feel like you want to be moderating, I'm happy to take over. If you feel cool, that's good. But I, I don't mean to overly uh, uh, take advantage of your generosity in being here. So your call. Uh, um, well, Cheryl, you know more people than I do. So perhaps it would be better for you to. Okay. Do. Okay. I'll take over then. But, but as you say, first, we'll turn to the panelists and see what they want to say in response to your comments. And thank you so much for those comments. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I can start by saying a few things in response to um, your response. Thank you for your response, Dr. Sheldon. Um, it's really helpful to have you draw out so many of the like salient themes that brought us all together and the salient concerns that we're all trying to work through. Um, just surely as like a practice of like, how do we do this? Like a concern of method. Um, I have been thinking about this a lot because as I've been like writing my way into talking about norms, um, which I felt some trepidation about when I started doing it. Um, I've been trying to like think about this question um, and Christopher Castiglia's entry in the critique and post critique um, collection um, talks about a uh, critique of critiquiness, which he bases on Col Stephen Colbert's old term truthiness, uh, perhaps some of us remember. Um, and he tries to formulate like a criticism as hope practice. Um, I can't recreate his entire argument about that, but I think that kind of thing um, better describes the manner and the affects that motivate me um, when I want to think about these texts or when I'm, when I'm like inspired to write about them. Um, and I do worry a lot about the norm of like the legible body. Um, this isn't the only dissertation chapter where I write about uh, like uh, the individual person and the like, problem of like humanist autonomy. Um, so yeah, I, and I was even uncomfortable like using the word individual in the paper. I went back and forth on like what words to use um, depending on like how psychoanalytic my audience might be that day. Um, so yeah, I don't have a significant response, I guess, to that part, but um, it is the thing that I also grapple with. And Sean or Summer, did you have anything you wanted to say at this point? Um, yeah, I had a few thoughts in relation to Dr. Sheldon's comments, which are fascinating. Um, a lot of things you brought up have been things I've also been thinking about. I don't really have a clear answer to any of those questions. This might just be kind of a disconnected train of thoughts. Um, but I think it's really interesting. You started off talking about kind of the anti-normative impulse and scholarship and how we're sort of moving past that. I think you especially see that in all the protests against kind of the social distancing guidelines where people are feeling like they don't have their individual freedom, so they have to transgress. And that's obviously not a kind of politics we want to support. Um, and that's something that I've been thinking a lot, cause I guess the norm I've been focused on, obviously, on presentation is sort of academic writing norms and how much we should kind of give those credence or push against them or transgress them, right? Um, I think a lot of my issues with a lot of the expectations for academic writing are that they tend to be kind of, what I would say, like uselessly dense or kind of um, unaccessible. But then, like you were saying, it's not like we want or there's no point in argument or critical thought or being very rigorous and, and like thorough, specific in the words we use, the language we use, and how we examine like history, who we cite. We do want to be careful and thorough about our scholarship, right? Then there's also the question of wanting to make academic writing more accessible to the public, especially for those of us interested in like grassroots political movements. Um, so I don't have an answer to that, but that's something I've been thinking a lot about, about how you balance kind of this desire for rigor scholarship, rigorous scholarship, um, and you also don't want to fall into sort of the anti-intellectualism of the Trump administration, but also kind of this desire for accessibility. And also, I think there is 
there can be some usefulness to like aesthetic beauty in writing, like in Sadia Hartman and in M Archive, where there's this really like poetry that kind of contributes to the politics and what the work is doing. Um, so I don't know, that's something I'm interested in thinking about how to balance like accessibility versus rigor, specificity in writing. Um, but I think, I guess just one thing that's been helpful for me is realizing, especially as I've been thinking through post-truth versus critical fabulation, is that we tend to get caught up in these kind of like useless binaries of is it true or not? Is it like fact-checked or not? And so I think it's just more useful to kind of shift our questions to, well, what is it doing? Like, how is it critiquing a given power structure? What's the context it's coming from? What level of institutional power does the writer possess? So kind of just shifting our questions to more nuanced examinations instead of just, is it this or that? How do we categorize it? Okay, I think that's all my thoughts, but thank you so much. I found all of your comments super insightful and thought-provoking. And Sean? Um, yeah, totally. Thank you so much. That was super interesting. Like the, all the, I was really into like, you know, both Professor Sheldon, your comments as follow up, and then also um, Walter um, and Summer, your papers, super awesome. Um, what I would say is, uh, in response, I was really interested in this question of norms. Um, to me, n establishing normative or norms in language and in writing is very transgressive and it feels very transgressive, um, especially given the kind of institutionalization of a certain form of like post-structuralist critique in the American State University, which is in many ways like a kind of commodification of like a, a very particular genealogy of French thought that was quite structuralist like at its core. And I think there's a lot of really interesting work Eleanor Kaufman's doing right now and others excavating the kind of structuralist vein and people like Foucault and uh, Deleuze and other thinkers who really influenced like, I, yeah, I just think post-structuralism ironically, I guess, is a floating signifier at this point. Um, and so I'm kind of interested in like dialectically dancing between like, I suppose it, even using, I don't know, even initiate like starting the conversation from the context of post-structuralism and its institutionalization um, kind of uh, encumbers, like it already encumbers the capacity of thinking about language as like a normative space. Um, so I kind of try to like in my writing, who I cite, how I cite them, how I uh, kind of uh, allow the writing to be affected very dramatically by my citations. Um, which aren't mine, and I, I, I try very, um, very, very seriously in my writing to make that clear that, like, it's not my text, like, it's not, uh, I'm not the author of it. Um, I think that there's a way to kind of, like, um, think about transgression and normative thinking uh, in a dialectical mode that might not um, encumber normative thinking as a priori or immediately hurled into a space that is, uh, I don't even know, I don't even, I don't even see it anymore. I can't. <laughs> okay, I just wanna make sure you're, you're good, yes? I'm sorry? Are, are you, you're finished? You just wanted to, yeah, okay, good. So um, I'll open it up now to the floor and this is gonna show sadly how much time I spend on Zoom lately. So for those of you perhaps less familiar with Zoom, on the bottom of your screen, you can click on a little button that says participants, and then a little window will open to your right where your names will appear, and you can click on a little raise hand thing, and that'll let me know that you would like to speak. And I see Dr. Envers has also spent a lot of time on Zoom and has already utilized this function, so I will open the floor with your question, thanks. I just learn quickly. I don't spend that much time anywhere uh, except at home, of course. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Johannes. Uh, I am in comparative literature and art history at UCR. And um, I'm also relatively familiar with the work of Walter, especially, uh, I would say. So I have two brief questions for Walter and Sean. Um, respectively. Um, so thanks again for your papers. Um, I've, I've also, Summer, of course, your paper as well, uh, which I found very engaging, uh, all three of them. Um, so, uh, Walter, while I do agree with you that we can talk about things non-existent, um, 
I wonder how does that make post-national units uh, or orders different from, say, uh, unicorns uh, who are also uh, non-existent. So my question basically is what is at stake uh, at your work uh, for yourself, uh, especially considering that uh, many of the examples that you draw on are fictional, uh, are works of fiction. So um, how are those political utopias in fiction different from historical utopias, which are not fictional, such as say the Declaration des Droits de l'Homme or whatever. Um, so what are, what are, are there any differences in propositional structure? Um, that would matter uh, to your argument. Um, and for Sean, my question is, if I remember Goodman's ways of world making correctly, uh, the point of his book is that you cannot make up new or alternative worlds from scratch. We, also ha we always have to go back to already known animals, uh, elements of, of known <laughs> uh, worlds, which which also for the sake of abbreviation could be called known animals. Uh, so these known elements of known worlds, we actually do recombine into what then becomes uh, our new, uh, as it were, world view. Um, and of course, Goodman talks in great detail about uh, um, ways how these recombinations work. Um, but I'm wondering to what extent that insight of Goodman is also reflected in your own research uh, in that you go back to concepts from the past, such as sustainability, such as world literature, such as criticism, um, yet add at the same time new and different prefixes to them, such as post-sustainability, such as geo-literature, such as, uh, as Walter cited, uh, critique or criticism of critiquiness. Um, how does that make our own new concepts, alternative concepts, already right? Uh, or does it make us overlook the fact that they are potentially historical themselves? Uh, so rather than embarking on a vantage point of a post histoire from which we would prevent, we'd be prevented from not becoming a part uh, of the history that we talk about ourselves. Uh, so what I'm basically asking you is to, in an act of critical fabulation, imagine a, criti a criticism of your own research in say 10 to 15 years from now. Okay, so Walter, do you want to go answer first and then we'll turn to the question for Sean after you've answered? Yeah. Um, so, uh, okay. So, thank you for your question, Dr. Andrews. Um, so, you asked at one point, "What is at stake in your work?" Which is every grad student's favorite question. Um, and um, how are political utopias in fiction different from historical utopias? Um, uh, inciting the, I don't speak French, but I have read that title: "The Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen." Um, uh, so, what is at stake, I think in this sense, um, okay, so I'll try to give an example and then um, use it as an explanation. Um, so in the Habermas Transnational Democracy essay, he basically is already critiquing political units, uh, right? and he argues that states as a fragmented system are inadequate to the increasing like interdependence that people's experience thanks to like transnational economy and migration all the facets of globalization that we're used to like, talking about um and in a certain sense like nation states um like could function better in response to these conditions um, and so he comes up with his like form of transnational democracy in order to respond to this. So we are already involved in a critique of political units in a post-national context. Um, and I think the point of bringing it together with the text is a means of clarifying critique um, in the sense of 
in Habermas's work, like the actual norm that he's really concerned with um, isn't fully clear. Um, although if someone has read the article more recently than I, uh, you could dispute that. Um, uh, and I think Exit West like really makes that clear when it um, has the scene with the technology in the end. And so I think um, comparing the fiction and philosophy here is really productive for the norm that's kind of present in both, but not fully articulated. And so that's what I'm trying to do with um, an act of criticism. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer the difference between utopias and fiction from historical utopias. Um, it's basically, if, if I may interject, it's yeah. basically the question that we, I think, have discussed uh, in, in the past already. Uh, and, and you just um, were, uh, again, uh, referring to it um, uh, just a second ago. So to what extent can fiction and philosophy even be compared, basically? Mm -hmm. It sounds like a big question, but I assume you have, a, you have, a, you have an answer for it. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll get back to you when I finish that dissertation chapter. Um, uh, I mean, to what extent can they be compared? I think the way I'm thinking about that is partly a philosophy of literature and like writing about the nature of fictionality um, from Catherine Gallagher's work on the history of the novel. Um, because she uh, does some work to, to like engage with the problem of like, we feel like we learn things about the world when we read books, but like they're not actually this one that you and, all, that you and I all share. Um, so that's how I'm following up on that question. Um, I do sometimes think that like as a way of thinking, it's about as productive as like reading philosophy in general, which is at the end of an argument, your audience might just be like, no, that doesn't make any sense, you're wrong, go away. Or your audience might be like, yeah, that rings true to me. Okay, I can take that on board. Um, and so I guess it's like to reference something Dr. Sheldon said, just a matter of like being persuasive. Um, I am definitely trying to be persuasive. Um, and you should, I agree. So thank you. That makes it much clearer for me. So rather than what you're actually talking about then is probably a philosophy of literature indeed, which of course would not require, to my understanding at least, uh, a comparison of philosophy and literature. You could just be a philosopher talking about literature. And that's, that's okay. I mean, and not that I uh, have to agree, but I do. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so Sean, uh, you can answer now. And then I see that Rebecca has her hand up to ask a question next. And anyone else who would like to ask a question, you can use the raise hand things and I'll keep a speaking order list. So Sean. Totally. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I think that's probably, I had a really, um, I think that I prob like the, the kind of undercurrent of my writing is probably addressing uh, the epistemology of world making that I have set up as a new theory of history. I think that's probably what I'm going to have to do because I, I'm tr I mean, the closest thing I can think of is like, Althusser's um, critique of historicism is probably going to be where I start with that. Uh, but yeah, I'll have to figure out how to um, come up with a theory of history uh, that is completely asubjective um, and is completely oriented around language as a social space. Um, that's probably yeah, <laughs> that's kind of where I'm going already. Like I was going to do that later today. So I really appreciate your question because I think history is the one thing because I critique things like historicism and area studies, but I haven't made that explicit and I haven't brought it into the text. And I love it that later today you're going to come up with an entirely new theory of history. So uh, clearly <laughs> my students are surpassing my capacities to do things in lockdown. Uh, Rebecca, you had additional comments? You have to unmute yourself too. So. I wanted to make sure that Summer didn't have, Summer, did you want to respond to the questions that the other two panelists were just asked? 
Um, well, I did have some thoughts, but I'm not familiar with a lot of the scholars, I think, from like in comparative literature they were citing, so I may have been misinterpreting the questions. But I was interested in kind of how we distinguish literature from philosophy. And that's when I, I kind of um, started out in terms of disciplines and feminist science studies. And so um, a lot of the work I was doing was thinking about how like science fiction novels can be seen as kind of like theoretically weighty is like actual science. Um, and one thing I found interesting was kind of the presence of thought experiments, even in actual scientific experiments, like Schrodinger's cat, and like is not a form of fabulation too. So just that the boundaries are already kind of blurred. It's not that like we're the first ones to be blurring them, right? Um, that was my only thought. Um, actually, Summer, uh, in response to what you just said and in response to your presentation in general, I'm going to recommend a really old text um, and clearly like you have a robust research agenda like that you're already uh, working through but um, Carl Friedman's book Critical Theory and Science Fiction um, explicitly does a lot of the things you're talking about um, for using science fiction as a means of critical theory. I mean like it really follows up on the title and um, I found it quite rewarding. So even if you, even if it's not something you cite, it might be an example of a thing, a book that does the kind of thing you're, you want to do, um, even if it's working with like slightly different text. So um, he writes about like Philip K. Dick. Um, but I think it, your talk really reminded me a lot of it. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm familiar with Carlo Friedman's work. Okay. I'm about to check out the book at length, thank you. And, and Rebecca, did you have an actual question to you or yes? Yeah, so I wanted to, so Johannes's um, question reminded me that, that, well, so when Sean stopped talking, I, 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 I wasn't quite, I think maybe both of us um, were, were not quite, uh, I felt like we both had something on the tips of our tongues that wanted to come out, but we were not quite there yet in the actual talking. Um, so I, thank you for the opportunity to jump back in. I know other people have questions. Um, but Johannes's question to, uh, to Sean to, to historicize uh, the ideas in the presentation, just reminded me, I guess, that, um, you know, there's a question that I was trying to get at that is, a, 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 in my remarks, that is a compositional and, and methodological question for sure, but I don't think it's well described by post-critique, in part because I think what I'm, what I'm asking is not so much how do we read, but how do we write, right? So post-critique is often about, like, how do we address texts? How do we think about texts? And um, what do we derive from them? How do we treat them? Whereas I think what I'm asking is a much more compositional question, what do we do with texts, right? What do we do not just with the texts that we read, but what do we do with the texts that we write? And to answer that question, I think it's really important, um, and this is what my new project is aiming toward, to imagine that our ideas are not just static, um, uh, you know, they're, they're not static, they don't happen in one-to-one -one dissemination, like I persuade you of something and then you believe it, and that's how ideas disseminate. Um, that in fact, there what we what I think we need. Um, this is just me ranting now. <laughs> um, is a way to describe what happens to ideas that's not institutional, in the way that Sean was talking about the institutionalization of poststructuralism, but that also isn't about their utility because they translate to some uh, some putatively more real kinds of communities like grassroots activists. Right. That, that we need a middle ground in which we treat ideas as real in themselves. Um, and I think Elizabeth Gross's most recent book, though I think it has some problems, um, called The Immaterial, is really interesting on this question. Um, but I'm also trying to, to think about it. And I, I think what it really, and the point of all of this is just to say, it really calls on us, I think, to think about the kairos of ideas. That is, what are they doing now, right? And so the question of historicizing Sean's idea is also to say, what will it look like from the vantage of a moment in which we know more about the moment that we're in? And yet, what we, can all, we can only operate from the present. And so I'm reminded a little bit of what Jose Mano says um, about utopian thinking, which is something like, what we need to do is to connect the no longer remembered to the not yet here, right? So some, in, some incipient sense with some, um, something of the virtual past, right? To bring those together, to form an idea that has a kind of um, political saliency in the present that isn't reliant on its persuasiveness or its utility for a functional political group, but instead because of the way that it interacts with other existing ideas. 
Um, and I, I guess that that's really what I was trying to aim at with my question was something like, you know, how do we do that in the mode of kindness and generosity and pleasure and love <laughs> rather than just tactics? <laughs> um, because it can sort of start to feel like sophistry. Um, so that was what I, I picked up from all of your talks the, through the three talks today. And, and you know, some are in particular, you're thinking about um, Nyong'o and critical fabulation is, is the, this, you know, how, how is it a tactic that's also just like, a kind of self-soothing, you know? I love that Nyango starts at the beginning with that amazing description of just, like a, just, a, just a kind of fabulous reading that's just self-soothing. So, there, so there's a Kairos that's about ideas, but there's also a Kairos that's about what we need for ourselves in the present. And that was not a question at all, it was just me ranting. <laughs> it was, it was uh, excellent and connected a lot of what's going on in all the papers, so thank you for that. Um, I was, uh, Going to actually give a shout out to, uh, I'll abuse my, my role as moderator for a moment and just say, I think part of what came across, um, at least for me, but I'm doing that usual uh, audience thing where I'm like, how do your ideas connect to my ideas? Um, but that all of the papers, um, sorry, I'm joined by a non-human participant here. Um, all of the papers are interested in like, thinking of new, new ways of being, new ideas around subjectivity. And I think that's part of trying to get at the question you also, uh, one of the ways you posed it, Rebecca, about like, what are these texts doing? Like, instead of what do they mean? Um, what are they doing? What are they enacting in the world, in us? And I think all three of um, people's research, that's ultimately the horizon in which people are interested. And I see um, Josh has a question now. Um, I guess actually I should pause first and see if any of the panelists wanted to say anything further in relation to what Rebecca just said, or if we want to go on to a new question. Okay, Josh then. Hello. Uh, I actually uh, am in some ways following up uh, Rebecca's remarks uh, and kind of making it uh, explicitly into a question um, for Summer where one of the things uh, that you really frames your engagement with uh, critical fabulation with is the ways that some of the kind of uh, rhetorical techniques and poses of critical fabulation have been like, have this dark echo in right-wing rhetoric now. Um, and I found, um, especially in my teaching, that my students now assume that the default position of any kind of intellectual debate is a position of bad faith. So how is, uh, how is the kind of bad fabulation that you see, um, how does it manifest a kind of bad faith, like a good faith critical discussion is to try and construct some kind of other viewpoint, um, whereas it seems like a lot of bad faith critical fabulation is about the negation or destruction of the idea of a viewpoint outside of whatever power is. Um, so, I don't know, where do you see kind of the position of like making arguments in good or, good or bad faith uh, in the kind of distinction you're trying to draw between a, a gendered of fabulism and a kind of destructive fabulism as practiced by right-wing politics? Yeah, it's a big question. Thank you. Um, well, I will say this is something, this quandary is something that I've also experienced in the classroom. I'm teaching a class on speculative memoir, this quarter that's really about um, kind of taking the self viewpoint and taking the I seriously, interrogating the autobiographical. Um, and so it's kind of like thinking about the subjective as like a serious form of evidence and theorizing. But then, you know, I have my, my students do discussion post. And so a lot of their posts tend to be like, well, I like this character, but this person's a bad person and like, just like their feelings. And so as I'm thinking about kind of the importance of thinking about the affect of scholarship, you also see kind of the clear, like what you said, like bad faith or bad fabulation that's just kind of about, I don't know, like your own like, not narcissistic relation, but your own like kind of instinctive feelings without any sort of critical interrogation of like your relation to the text, what it's trying to do, that type of thing. So I don't have a clear answer, like in my own project. It's probably not the right way to go about it, but I'm trying to think of like a clear way to define like what good fabulation is. But obviously you see like what Sadia Hartman is doing in Wayward Lives, even though she's using the speculative, she's doing it from like dense, like long, like 
a lifetime of working with these archives and with working with black studies, um, you know, archive scholarship. She's doing it from like a background of like dense knowledge and engagement with the subject and not just kind of like her first initial impressions without like taking the time to kind of sit with that. So I think a lot of it is about like, putting the time, the effort, we could call it care with the subject, but not kind of just like instinctual reactions. Um, so again, that's not, I don't think, you know, having like a one, two, three, four elements of r correct fabulation is the way to go about it, but I think there is a way we can distinguish between good and bad, as you're pointing out. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I see no, no hands currently up, so I have a, a couple of thoughts I would offer that I think, um, I think that was an excellent question and an excellent answer. And I liked the, the phrase you used, Josh, about a viewpoint outside of power, because I think that circles back to the sort of critical moment we're in and the work that um, Dr. Sheldon was doing around if we're not in the moment of transgressing norms, and we're maybe not precisely in a moment of like articulating a different set of norms because we've already sort of we've seen that show we know the where that leads are we in a moment of thinking through like um what it is to articulate in a modality that necessarily um is adjacent to power. Although I guess that's getting me back to like Frankfurt School critique again. So maybe there are, there are new cri new critical vocabularies under the sun. But especially like what um, Summer said about care instead of like here's the five points of a new program on fabulation, but a way to think of fabulating um, through a commitment to knowledge and care. It reminds me of some of the work that's being done in speculative fiction around um, this is not my phrase, but quote unquote writing the other and the sort of um, ethical obligation to educate oneself in order to have characters of different ethnicities or sexualities or other kinds of things. And maybe there is some kind of like uh, epistemological commitment that is one of the reasons the speculative is what we turn to as a mode that brings these things together. Because of course, extrapolating from the known has always been uh, a, an important part of um, speculative fiction, especially in its science fiction modality. There's not really a question there either. There's just me throwing some ideas out there and seeing if any of them stick to the wall and anyone wants to respond or uh, elaborate or refute or move us in an entirely new direction of, co of conversation. Um, I'll just say that I think that does offer a really good point as to how to think about good versus bad fabulation. So I know like the um, speculative author Nisi Shaw runs a workshop on writing the other and it's all about exactly what you're talking about in terms of just putting the time and effort to research kind of the others you're interested in including in your own writing. And obviously that doesn't necessarily ensure an ethical like approach to writing the other, um, but it is one way to try to demonstrate your commitment and kind of perform that commitment. And I mean, it's potentially because it has a um, educational element to it, um, it potentially opens up to sort of notions of persuasion and change and things like that too, as one likes to believe that in learning you might be changed. I see I have a comment here, except for I have to lean forward because I'm too blind to read the screen. Um, uh, generous versus ungenerous speculation rather than good and bad. Yeah, that's a good way of framing it. Although I think, uh, whoever said this, I think Josh, you probably said this, that the, it's more than just ungenerous, right? In some cases, there's a true bad faith desire to mislead and to close things down to a single authorized meaning as opposed to the generative, which is also generous in opening things up, right? Any other questions, comments? Oh, I see. Josh, your hands, is it up again or still up? Yep, go. Um, this is a, a kind of more specific question rather than these kind of big capacious questions we have been asking. Um, and it's a question for Sean. Um, kind of uh, earlier in your remarks, you uh, really used the, the image of, this, of, of mining as kind of a characteristically pernicious petrocultural formation. But um, the character in the book is still you know, venturing deep into the earth to find a liquid resource. Um, so I, I was wondering how is 
uh, how does water foster a different kind of mineral relation than oil? How does it fit into this kind of solar optimism if it's still a kind of chthonic resource that must be quested after in the earth? That's an awesome question. Um, it will, so he totally fails, right? That's like the important part of it is that he gets the extra energy source of water. He expends all of this terrestrial energy trying to find another source and yet it fails. And from that, we can derive an alternative model as opposed to the one that is caught within this like, you know, binary way of thinking, for example, like if something's generous, well then what is ingenerous? Or if something is good, then what is bad? Like that precise way of thinking, well, what is a good energy resource? What is a bad energy resource? Um, he ultimately fails. And I think that's like a very interesting kind of irony to the text. Um, I'm really interested in uh, Edelman's work, particularly on irony, which is a long tradition, as well as people like Damon, where I think irony is really, it can be a very powerful tool. Um, it can be something that um, can be used to dismantle institutions that have become, you know, kind of, I don't know, uh, relativist, overly focused on the local, as opposed to any kind of like ambition outside of itself. I think it's uh, quite generous to think outside of that. Um, and then the question is, of course, of an infinite kind of irony, which I think is, you know, maybe something interesting. Um, you know, it's not just uh, a kind of rhetoric of the right. I don't think, I'm, I, as far as I'm understood, post-structuralism at this point has been completely commodified by the right uh, in meme culture. So I think it's interesting to kind of look at everything as though it were fair game to be used um, for some kind of project oriented towards egalitarianism and justice. Thank you. Um, so we're getting near the end of our time. Is there any last comments or final questions anyone has? So um, thank you again so much, uh, Rebecca, Dr. Sheldon, for your time and for launching us off in a really like provocative train of thought for a conversation. Um, and I'm gonna, and thank you to my students, those, both those who presented and those who came to support your peers. I appreciate that. I'll turn it back over to Catherine and thank you again, the Center of Ideas and Society for giving us this, this platform for the students to get some feedback on their work. So I'll turn it over to you to, to wrap things up. Thank you. So can I, can I just interject for a minute? Yes. Um, uh, so to the three panelists, if, uh, so thank you again for, for allowing me to, to interact with your work. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that if you want to continue these conversations, if you want um, to talk with me about any of these ideas or about the papers, you're always welcome to contact me. I'm very available um, to find through the Indiana University website. So, so please feel, feel free to, to get in touch. Thank you, Rebecca. And I echo Cheryl's thanks. Thanks to you all. And thanks to Cheryl <laughs> just to bounce that thanks back. Thank you so much. And so I hope that you all stay well. I'm really grateful to have spent the last hour and 55 minutes with you. And I hope for a chance in the future to do this again, but in person. So <laughs> take care and we will you. Uh, see you soon. Thank you so much.